Hello, Booktopians, and welcome to a very special event where we're talking with author and philanthropist and advocate Sarah Wilson. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to Booktopia, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's sort of like a three-yearly event doing these kinds of things, although I usually do it in at your offices at um, Booktopia. So it's a little bit different doing it like this. But, yeah, thank you for have, having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, as you've alluded to, 2020 has been quite the year. Um, what's it been like for you? Oh, gosh. Um, well, funnily enough, I mean, I've been finishing off this book that we're here talking about today. Um, but it was quite bizarre because I was going to hand it in to my publisher um, sort of about five months ago. Um, but because of what happened, it was first the bushfires and then it was COVID and then it was the political stuff that was happening around the world. It put a pause on things for a whole range of reasons. Um, but what it actually did was reveal and expose and probably validate many of the themes in my book because, as you'd know, Mark, that the book covers off all of these themes. Um, as somebody said to me, it was almost like I was writing away and then it would kind of, bushfires would happen and I'd have to sort of write that. And they said, Sarah, please just publish this book because next thing aliens will land or something like that unless you get this book in. So um, I guess you'd say that 2020 has been very meta for me, you know. Um, I've been living out what I'm writing about as I'm writing about it, uh, yeah. which has been quite good in many ways because the book was very much um, a journey I want, went on to try to find a philosophical and spiritual path through everything that we're experiencing and so it became a great comfort for me because I had to live out what I was writing about so it sort of buttressed me in many ways. Mm. Yeah and it's um it, it, it does it it feels like a really timely book in so many ways in that it feels like it would have been very timely were it published at the time it was originally intended to be published before everything happened. And um, and it's clear that, that the delay did give you a chance to kind of go back and kind of add in this extra layer um, around uh, COVID and, and the kind of direct impact of that. Um, were there any other opportunities that, that that gave you to kind of, did you take a fresh look at some of the perspectives that you were talking about in the book as well? Yeah, because I think just like everybody on the planet, um, COVID um, shifted my thinking and forced me into a place of a certain amount of wisdom, you know, that I didn't think I possessed. Um, we were rendered choiceless. And in many ways, I think COVID, I call it the great revealer. It revealed, it took off a layer and revealed to us what was going wrong with our lives. It revealed the redundancies, everything from businesses that weren't going to last into the future, perhaps anyway, relationships perhaps that were no longer valid lifestyle habits, um, consumer behaviour, you know, uh, businesses in terms of, um, I mean, we suddenly got a feel for the fact that nurses, teachers, um, supermarket workers, healthcare workers were the essential services. Stockbrokers, not so much, you know. And so um, for me, yeah, it was COVID revealed a whole heap of stuff and it rendered me choiceless and it forced me to a next level, I suppose, of adulthood. And for anyone reading the book, the penultimate chapter is called Becoming an Adult. And it's about um, that aspect of the journey. And for anyone who is aware of the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's um, sort of thesis that a lot of plot lines work to in the world, um, I sort of suddenly realised that what I'd been doing was something of a hero or heroine's journey. And COVID just got me to that, through that last hurdle. It got me super real. And so, yeah, the, the rewriting of the book around COVID, the bushfires, everything else, wasn't just about kind of topping and tailing and searching a few little COVID references. I actually did go through, I hate to use this word, but a pivot in my own life and in my own sense of spiritual grounding and also the intellectual ideas I was having. And it it actually brought it into a great deal of focus, I think, as it did for just about everything on the planet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I think I think what's kind of coming out of, of, of our discussion already is is just how much is is in this book. And 
how much you can kind of talk about and all the different kind of angles you can take and the philosophies and the ideas. I feel like it could almost have been like three times as long as it was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so how would you pitch this one wild and precious life uh, to somebody who's never heard of it? Okay, I would say it's um, a soul's journey through, and I'm going to use a word, it's an army, an army term, and those... Those of, those of you out there who follow me know I've used this word before, through the clusterfuck of contemporary life, um, mm -hmm. technical army term. I, I'm not just using a profanity for the sake of it. Um, I think that we, have, uh, we are feeling all kinds of emotions we've not felt before, predominantly overwhelm and bamboozlement. And this exploration I go on is a... If Beast was an inward journey, first we make the Beast beautiful was an inward journey to understand the real substance and, and beauty and purpose of um, our personal anxiety. This book, Wild and Precious, takes us outward to each other, to a reconnection so that we can join each other on a soul's journey to what really matters and, as I say, through that clusterfuck. Um, mm. And it's... I don't want to give away the ending. However, what I would say is that the journey and the arrival point that I finally arrived at at the end, and I write my books in real time, so I don't know where I'm going to end up at. I take the journey on the, the reader on the journey with me. I really, when, when I started this book three years ago, I didn't know where I'd end up. I genuinely, innocently wanted to find a way because I was despairing. I've been a climate activist all my life. I... Um, I've been active in the race area. I've been sort of engaged a little bit somewhat with Black Lives Matters um, and here in Australia for about three years. And I was despairing about what was happening. I knew that we weren't connected. So I really wanted to find a path. And as I say, I'm not going to give away the ending, but the arrival point, I call it a form of radical hope. And it's actually more oh, beautiful, simple, joyous and achievable than... I thought it could be and it kind of solves this is kind of you know I'm promising a whole heap here I'm, not, I'm gonna leave out steak knives but um, it actually kind of is a sell for the climate stuff the race stuff the COVID stuff the uncertainty and the disconnect we feel from each other the planet and what matters it's a silver bullet <laughs> so it sounds like writing this book has been quite um, kind of a necessary therapy for you, if, if I'm not kind of mistaken in, in the approach here, like a way for you to kind of process everything that's going on. 100%. Um, first We Make the Beast Beautiful was as well. It was something I had to go through. That was a six, almost seven-year um, journey. Uh, I take a while to work out my stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that actually, the the sort of, the therapy that it provided continued on well after the book came out because the conversations I was having in public, suddenly I felt less alone. And I and I say that at the beginning of First We Make the Beast Beautiful. Why did I write the book? Because I was sick of feeling so alone with this. Now, this book has done the same. What I did with this one, it was an outward journey, so I had to go outward, right? The courage that First We Make the Beast Beautiful brought me um, actually enabled me to go out into the world and have even bigger and deeper and wilder conversations with poets and a crazy nun that I met and all these random people, pre-COVID obviously, around the world that helped me come up with this, I suppose, polemic, this soul's journey, this soul's path. Um, but, yeah, along the way I was forced, as I say, to find my courage rise to my best self, uh, I was rendered choiceless. I had to face what was going on and helped by COVID and all the, the lockdown process and the isolation and everything, it certainly helped. But I suspect, and I write my books quite selfishly, Mark, like I write them because I want to engage with the world and I want to have the discussion after the book comes out. Discussions like this is why mm -hmm. I write book you know um and and with this book what i've done is i've set up a whole kind of program that will roll out for over a year of book clubs around the world mm -hmm. so there's a couple of different aspects to that there's actual literal book clubs i'm going to be doing book clubs with influencers and then i'm also doing a um tour around regional and metropolitan australia and new zealand early 2021 with live nation so that's 
a big tour and it'll be a mega book club discussion mm -hmm. um, with the country. So, yes, hopefully, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a very, very convoluted way to do therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you're right. And um, I like to do my therapy with others. Yeah, that sounds like a that sounds like a great approach. Yeah. <laughs> so something I wanted to I wanted to pick up on um, at at the beginning of the book, um, I, I love that you say I walked this book, kind of as opposed to I wrote this book, which I think is a lovely way to talk about the creative process that, that you went through here. Can you explain a little bit about that to um, people who might not be familiar with what you did? Yeah. So um, in essence, I tell this story while hiking around the world. So um, there was some gnarly stuff there's gnarly stuff that i bring up i mean i do an entire quite long chapter pulling apart the neoliberal model and already i'm sure some some of you listening your eyes are blazing over going what and so i i discussed all of that while hiking in the footsteps of frederick nietzsche who pulled apart the sort of the capitalist model and predicted neoliberalism at its worst um back in the 18 the late 1800s um but I also found that over the same mountain, um, Heidi, the, the fictional character, uh, it was my favourite book when I was five, it was set on the same sort of mountain range on the other side in exactly the same period and it criticised exactly the same ideas. Anyway, so I hike to sort of almost sexify or sort of make it all relatable, all these complex themes. Um, but also I, as you say, I hike it out. I hike out this entire journey, this adventure, because that is how I've always been able to think clearly and to write. Now, as it turns out, I quickly found out that some of the biggest thought leaders and writers in the world throughout history also hiked. So Nietzsche, Charles Dickens, um, Darwin, um, you know, all kinds of philosopher Virginia Woolf, um, Henry Miller, um, Sylvia Plath, they hiked to be able to think. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of wonderful quotes. Of course, there's Thoreau and a whole bunch of, you know, Walt Whitman and so on, of course, were big. It's, um, and, and Wordsworth, of course, were big proponents of hiking. But then I dug down into the science of it all because, and those of you who know the way I write, I sort of shift between art, theory, philosophy, spirituality and science. Um, the science shows that, and there's a bunch of studies, uh, particularly around forest bathing, uh, which is a Japanese um, and South Korean practice ordained by the government. It's, you know, health insurance covers, covers these practices and they've done 44,000 studies on this process. But it shows that when we hike, when we walk, we actually are able to think best. Hence, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all these various people did you know, walking meetings and, and that's been a big thing for a while. So I literally had to hike out not only the complex thoughts but also the pain, despair and grief that I went through over the last three years. Um, and, again, I don't want to give too much away but there was a lot of despair and grief around what's happening with the climate what was happening to human nature around me. And then also I went through some fairly intense personal um, ordeals, which I share mm -hmm. in the book as well. Um, but I, I hiked to process. I hiked to get real with my emotions. I hiked to be able to, to write. Yeah. Mm. I want to come back to hiking and to climate change and everything a little bit later, but but I had a question that um, may come across as a bit rambling, and and I apologise. This is very rambling, so join me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I started writing this one out a few times and it just kept kept getting away from me. But anyway, uh, you draw on a lot of different disciplines, ideas, and inspirations, not only in the book but but in your in your life. Um, and I think a lot of people are kind of on this journey for, for meaning and for purpose at the moment, which is why, you know, this, this book is so, is so timely. Um, how out of the great sea of possibilities in terms of, you know, concepts and ideas and philosophies and people, how do you decide for yourself? How did you decide for yourself which ideas were meaningful to you? And how would you advise somebody who's starting on this journey themselves to kind of uh, wade into that sea of, of yeah. concepts and thoughts and ideas and, and how to make sense of it? That wasn't so rambling. I <laughs> followed that fully. Um, okay. okay, so... Um 
first thing is I go down rabbit holes. So how did I choose? I just go down rabbit holes and I trust that process. Um, it's no big surprise because I first thing make the beast beautiful is about it. I have bipolar. That renders me to going down rabbit holes and not emerging again until I've come out with the thing that satiates or the thing that I feel I can share with my fellow humans. So I read a lot. Um, I read very deeply and in fact one of the chapters as you'd know is about becoming a soul nerd and I also have another chapter talking about deep reading and the art well, the, the importance of learning how to deep read again, and not just because it's a it's a um, noble thing to do, you know, um, but uh, for the the brain functionality um, and a range of other things, we need to learn how to 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 harness our attention once again so that we can deal with what's ahead. But um, yeah, I suppose um, there's so much information coming at us, and. I've learned to find trusted voices who have steered me to different thinkers over the years and I share all of those in the book, my trusted sources. And there's places, um, websites that bring the lovely collations of thinkers and I, I get a nice top line view. So some of them are brain pickings, On Being with Krista Tippett, a podcast series, um, literary I've forgotten the word. It's a I get I subscribe to it and I get it every day. Literary edit, I think it's called, um, yep. and it kind of exposes me to some top line thinking, and and then I'll deep dive, and then I'll go and get the book um, and read it, you know, and and then that will lead me to something else. And I suppose I, I take a long time to write a book, and I read a lot, and of course, as you know, I generally have one or two books that come with me on each hike. And I reference them. So there's a bunch of them, you know, philosophical books and all kinds of things. And I share those as I hike along and they generally pertain to whatever it is I then go on to discuss conveniently. Um, so, yeah, I suppose I deep dive and I enjoy that process. I don't resist it, you know. I don't shop, so that leaves me a lot of time for reading. <laughs> So there's that. Um, but the, the kinds of thoughts that I've always been drawn to, and I studied philosophy at university, um, I've always been drawn to the German existentialists. I've also always been drawn to stoicism. Um, I've been interested in any kind of economic theory that can work in a tangible way beyond the purely capitalist model. So I've always been intrigued by that. I love nuanced thinking. I love clever thinkers. For me, some people love, I don't know, wine tasting. I love tasting the eloquent, nuanced thinking of wonderful writers. And I also bring in a lot of writers, opinion writers and columnists from various newspapers. I get a lot of my information from there. And they'll expose me to a book or an idea that they've been pursuing. In terms of how people at home can get engaged. Well, I suppose you could read my book <laughs> because I do a top line sort of dance through them all and I bring in quotes and ideas from them and that might make you go, oh, I might go and read that book. And just for extra assistance, I don't bog the book. The book is a very thick book and I'll, you can probably see it's a reasonably thick um, book, this one. Um, I didn't want to bog it down with, you know, 100 pages of footnotes. So those footnotes sit on my website and I did that with First We Make the Beast Beautiful and reason being is I put the hyperlinks in. And the mm. So if you are on page 27 and you go, gosh, that's an interesting idea, you can go onto my website and there'll be the reference and often it's a book. It's a newspaper article, it's a, an original sourced um, scientific paper and you can then go and follow me down that rabbit hole. But, yeah, I, I've got all the books and all that kind of thing and I mention them all throughout, including podcasts um, and newsletters and, you know, um, that kind of thing. So, yeah, ho hopefully that helps. Yeah. I, I actually just wanted to say I liked your analogy there um, on um, – you know, uh, tasting ideas kind of like a, a wine tasting because, you know, if you don't like it, you can spit it out. And if you like it, you can get absolutely hammered on it. So Yeah, that's right. Yeah, deliriously. <laughs> uh, so there's quite a few practices that, that you talk about, um, and I was hoping you could give our viewers a little bit of an explainer on a couple of them. Um, for example, you talk about going to your edge. Uh, what do you mean by that and what are the benefits? Well, that's a, that's a reference that I learned from Pima Chodron and she's that Buddhist nun and she's written a bunch of books and if you want to 
in terms of a, a lovely spiritual thread to follow. She's she's wonderful. Her books are absolutely wonderful. Um, so going to your edge is essentially going to the place that scares you. And it can be a physical edge. And I actually share some practices for using physical edge to access that space. But we live in a culture that protects us, cocoons us from our edge. So the edge is the unknown. It's having to wait for things. It's being out of our comfort zone, essentially, you know, and um, we are cocooned from that. Like I use the analogy that we don't even have to wait. We don't have to be left wondering how long our pizza is going to take because we can follow the little dot on our phone on the delivery app, right? So um, I don't know if you're old enough to remember a time pre all of this, but I certainly am that old. Um, we kind of were inoculized. We were we were trained in in sort of not knowing, and we had to live at our edge. And it might have been just you know we'd make an arrangement on the second Tuesday of a school holidays to meet a friend at the bus interchange under the clock at precisely ten thirty, so that we could go to the park or a movie or whatever it was. I might not look it, but I remember those days. Okay. <laughs> You've heard of them. Um, so, yes, I mean, and we lived in a, you know, we used, that was what happened. And mm -hmm. we asked people out and we never knew, would the person turn up? What would happen if, you know, we, there was no way they could tell us that they'd missed the bus or broken their leg that morning when they were in hospital or whatever. And so we just had to leave, live with it and suck it up and find ways to fend and cope and then find a way to do the next thing, you know. Nowadays, there's an answer for everything. We can reach out. We, there's just, we don't have to live in any kind of edgy edginess. So we tend to think that going to our edge is wrong. And in fact, every bit of science shows that we are, as humans, at our best at our edge. As Pima Chodron says, um, our edge is where we're meant to be. Mm -hmm. and and I use the example, I've always felt I used to climb trees right up into well into adulthood and I still climb trees actually I'm in my late 40s and I, I sort of think about the idea of, you know, if you stay close to the trunk, it's very cosy and comfy, you know, and stable. But if you climb up higher and go out to outer branches, that's where you feel, smell, experience and see life, right? It's it's, it's where you get inspired and you're slightly scared and you've got to fend. And I use the word fend throughout the book. Humans are wonderfully creative when we're in a position where we don't know what's going to happen and we've got to use all our faculties. We're switched on and we fend. We make do. We build things out of nothing. Um, and I feel that part of the problem, part of the disconnection, the loneliness, the the acedia, which is that sort of slothfulness that we often feel, comes from the fact that we're denied the opportunity to go to that edge, to go into the breezy outer limbs and fully smell and see and experience life. And so I have various practices that can take you a little to your edge, some of which not everyone's going to be into, but there you go. Um, another one I wanted to um, ask about is um, buy less, live more. Hashtag buy less, live more. Um, and I think for, for me, this is, this is probably one of the trickier ones this year in particular, because I'm sure that um, I'm, I'm, it's a common experience that the online shopping habit, for example, has like kicked into high gear as just kind of a, a coping mechanism. Um, what are the benefits of buying less? And, and what do you think people should be doing to break the habits around shopping that we've developed? And what are some more positive ones that we can develop? Okay. So, yeah, the hashtag is buy less, live more. And, you know, I basically say, well, ever you're not at the shops, you're doing something more productive and fun, you know, and hiking. I have another hashtag, hike, don't shop, because while ever you're hiking, you can't go shopping and shopping begets shopping and and then shopping begets finding storage solutions and then you reach 85 and you realise you've just spent your entire life managing your pur purchases. Um, Look, I mean, it's a it's a climate, environmental, planetary imperative that we shop less. We all know that. Um, I I very much live this kind of way, not because I'm trying to be pious, not because 
Um, I'm a self-flagellating ex-Catholic or anything like that. Um, and not because my parents drummed it into me, although they did, and not they didn't drum it into us. They weren't minimalists or anything like that. They just didn't have a lot of cash and we lived out in the country and there was no rubbish service. So we had to make sure we didn't produce rubbish. You know, it was that simple. Um, and also they couldn't afford petrol to drive into town to buy stuff. And so we just had to fend, you know. Um, so I, but today um, I live very minimally. And in fact, I wrote that book while living out of one bag. Um, I travelled the world with one carry-on bag. Well, as it turns out, it was almost eight years, but definitely for those three years, that's how I lived. And from country to country, coming back into Australia from time to time. Um, and all I can say is it's joyous. Like when I weigh up buying shit and having a whole heap of stuff and living with just three pairs of underpants, I choose this option because it's <laughs> Two, three pairs of underpants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, for me, it's just how I like living, you know. Um, and so I try that whole chapter, I do up as a sort of a rundown and I try to show the joy, the fun bits of it, and I try to gamify it and so on So and show how I gamify it. Um, but, look, there's simple things that you can do, and that is, um, so going back to those ideas of um, being cocooned from living at our edge and mm -hmm. we have much better disciplines and, and practices, one of the big ones that has been shown through various psychological studies is delaying gratification. So if you can, we're a culture now that can't delay gratification. It's part of our brain that literally is sort of, unable to to do that and um there's always benefits from being able to do it so um i i sometimes let's use the underpants example and i think i use that in the book um i also get to the point where my underpants are literally the gussets that you know down around the kneecaps so it's time to go and get some more underpants and i'll think about the idea of having to go to go up to the mall and i don't own a car i've got to ride a single speed bike which i built from secondhand equipment 15 years ago I've got to get up a really steep hill. So it's a great psychological barrier. And so I'll go, can I be bothered? It's a sad day, it's sunny. No, I'll go hiking. And I'll leave it week after week and I'll just find I can get by. And then it'll get to a ridiculous point and, yep, I'll go up there and I'll just go and buy a bunch of things and I get out of there, you know. Mm -hmm. So I've created a simplicity around it. I've created, I've, I've come to see it through the lens of, being able to have freedom to do other things. We all claim we're time poor, which is another theme I cover off in the book. Um, and, you know, I just find myself with a lot of languid time to go and do stuff that matters to me. And when you're not shopping, you're not caught up in the bread and circuses trap of consumption. Because most of the stuff we buy, we buy because we've been given some sort of pressure to go and do it. Once you start not to do that and you pull yourself back from that suck hole of consumption, you start to get mindful about what matters to you. Now, that's not to say you don't ever buy things, and I still do buy things, but it'll be once a year, once every 18 months, I head up the hill to the shopping mall <laughs> and I will go and buy um, several items all at once. And twice I've been called, called by the credit card fraud squad for unusual spending activity on my credit card. Um, <laughs> I usually go in there and I go, right, pets. Same pair of sneakers, same pair of jeans, three extra pairs of underpants, you know, <laughs> a couple of vegetable knives and I'm out of there. Um, so, yes, it's – look, I, I, I have all kinds of techniques for it. And if you're an online shopper, um, there's little techniques that you can – I'm not an online shopper because I don't like the packaging, but um, – and I like to support local stores if I am going to go shopping. But I, I suggest there's things like where you can actually disable um, your credit cards for certain days. So, for instance, if you tend to shop on your payday, you can you can disable certain things. There's apps like Freedom um, where you can suspend certain aspects of your online activity. And there are some apps that I mentioned in the book where you can – your password to go and reactivate your internet or your access to some of these things has to be sent to a friend. So you've actually got to go and contact that friend if you want to activate it again. So there are some sort of um, boundary building processes that I share in the book and they're important. We can laugh at them, but we need to reprogram our brains to take back control of what matters to us. And so, yeah, I have a bunch of 
practices throughout the book and I try to show how I do it and I try to find it, show it through joyful ways, you know, gamification often. Yeah, and I, and I think I think that's that's what really stands out um, is that it's not a guilt trip. It's just about finding, like, the, the positive in it and, and the yeah. positive benefit that, that it can have. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, another thing that, that you mentioned, we, we've you touched on it before, but I wanted to go a little bit more in depth in that. Is um, you know, I, I don't know if you can tell from from the way that I look, but I'm a nerd, but I'm not a soul nerd. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, what 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 is a soul nerd, and why should I become one? Okay, a soul nerd. So, a soul nerd. It's a term that somebody else came up with, and they it's sort of an obscure blogger I happen to find. And he referred to the fact that there's several ways of connecting more spiritually and meaningfully with life. And there's the old sort of scriptures and, and sort of belief in God. And then there's more contemporary spirituality, which is more organic and sort of, you know, yoga and meditation and gongs and things. And it, then he said, and then there's soul nerding. And I was like, he didn't really go into a great deal of great deal of detail. But I then looked into some of the psychological benefits of doing things like deep reading engaging in the process of art appreciation, um, reading poetry, um, listening to classical music, um, reading prose more broadly, and I, or good quality prose. Now, I look like a nerd too. However, I didn't grow up a nerd and I certainly didn't grow up cultured. Like, so I've had to learn this and it was actually a really good thing. And I learned a lot of it through the process of writing this book, although I've had little sporadic moments of being exposed to it by accident um, in a really Philistine way. So if anyone's out there going, what art and poetry? Trust me, I know what you mean because I just didn't learn this stuff at school. I wasn't exposed to it growing up. Um, I used to do speed art. You know, I travelled the world and I'd go to Milan or London and I'd just go, whoop. Oh, there's the Mona Lisa. That was Paris. I do know that much. And, you know, I'd be out of there, you know, get the postcard at the shop to prove I'd been there. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I break it down in a little bit more detail. Soul nerding is about do, nerding out on stuff that can feed the soul. And there's a wonderful amount of psychological kind of um, uh, studies and also beautiful um, writing. Alanda Baton writes about it quite a lot. That... Um, shows how engaging mindfully in, in art, the brushstrokes themselves, or poetry, the rhythm of the language, and, and quite often it's the space between the words where there's a stillness, a space that it takes you to. Now, words can often be very literal and, and take you to a space that the author or the, you know, the the copywriter wants you to go to. With poetry, it takes you to a space that even words can't describe, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. poetry and art and certain types of music can take you to almost a communed um, experience that we can't tap into in everyday language, if that makes sense. And I know that through poetry. It can be four simple lines and you are there. It touches a heart string that... You're like, how the hell did that happen? Mm -hmm. And it's almost like it's it it's a it's a, a parallel universe. So, and I find, and and certain spiritual practices also do that. Meditation, they're very artful things that have existed for thousands of years, and we know as humans they work. They take us to a level of experience where we get a we get an experience of the oneness of life. Now, poetry is much the same. It has existed for hundreds, thousands of years in various forms, and it's all, it, it has been finessed to a point where it can do the same thing. Ditto mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it can take you to something that, how did I get there, you know? So um, I developed a, a real appreciation of that through the writing of the book, and um, I try to actively encourage people, and I walk people through how to do mm -hmm. Uh, you also talk about the idea of um, going full full fat spiritual. Yes. Um, what do you mean by that? So um, I talk about the light, L-I-T, you know, diet version of a bunch of things. Um, we, we, we are living in a sort of a, a diet way, diet relationships, diet connections, and then, of course, I think that we, we are doing spirituality light. Um, 
and therefore we need to get full fat with our spirituality. So what I mean by spirituality light is that we take the nice, pleasant versions of spirituality. So we'll do the love and light, but we don't do the sacrifice. Um, we will go to a yoga class and get all zen and at one with our yoga mat. Um, but then we come home and ignore the donate to, you know, the bushfires appeal that our friends have sent to us. Um, and then we'll also say that we're into, you know, our gong circles and whatever it might be, but we are not political. So I hear this quite a lot. Oh, yes, I'm spiritual, but I'm not into politics. And I actually, it took me a while to feel confident in saying this. I'm like, you can't be spiritual without being political. What do you think Jesus was? What do you think Gandhi was? They were political. Um, and I, I feel that the, anyone who's done the, the work in getting um, awakened in any kind of way, um, you know, it's almost a responsibility. If you've done that work and if you've opened yourself up to a connective mindset, then there is a responsibility to then use that to save this one wild and precious life, you know. So that chapter is very much about how to turn your awareness and your appreciation of spirituality into activation and to not be scared and to almost, and it's probably the most draconian I get, I think, in the mark, in the book, don't you think, Mark, where I actually go non-negotiable. <laughs> sorry, sorry, spiritualists, but, you know, you can't say I'm not into, into politics. You're going to have to get into it. You're going to have to get engaged. You can't walk around with a takeaway coffee cup on the way to your yoga your yoga practice, you know, um, there's a responsibility here. Absolutely. Mm. Um, I wanted to um, bring it back to, to hiking um, again, um, that idea of, of getting closer to nature as a, as a way forward. Um, what is it about hiking in particular that brings that closeness and what makes for a good hike? Okay. Um, well, I'll answer the second part of the question first by saying there's no such thing as a bad hike. Um, mm. I've never been on a hike I've regretted because I often get asked, what's your favourite hike in the world? And I've done, you know, literally hundreds around the world. Um, and I have to say my answer to that one is my next hike is the best hike, you know, like. So what makes a good hike? Um, I would say, look, it's it, – Actually, no, sorry, the first part of your question was how does it work to kind of engage you? Is that right? Bring, have, like bringing us closer to nature. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, all right, there's a couple of things. And, um, you know, so many studies that I could refer to, but I'll share my favourite ones. So one of the ones that I really like is that hiking goes at the same pace as discerning thought. And a big part of where we're going wrong in life today is we simply are not creating the space in our lives to be discerning, to be able to process through emotions and thoughts and soulful thoughts. So when we walk, we can actually process things, which is why those walking meetings and also a lot of psychiatrists um, were into that for a while, doing walking therapy sessions with their clients. It actually can get us doing discerning thought, which is why many of you watching this would know that when you go for a walk, with a friend, you find the conversation opens up beautifully. So that's one aspect of it. It goes at the same pace. We evolved into humans as upright beings uh, at the top of the food chain because of our ability to get vertical mm -hmm. so and to, to move forward. So all the processes that make us human evolved as we started to walk on two legs. So that all makes sense as well. Um, I mentioned this in First We Make the Beast Beautiful and then I bring it back into this book as well. That explains also why we can't be anxious and walk at the same time. Our flight or fight mechanism, that part of our brain, very closely linked to the part of the brain that also walks, um, you know, does the left-right motion um, because they evolved at the same time. I don't know, we were tadpoles and we sort of grew legs and, you know, and brains at the same time and got scared of wildebeest and, you know, <laughs> and tigers. And so, um, yes, our, that part of the brain can get overtaxed. If you walk, it's very hard to stay anxious. So that's another mm. thing. Um, walking in nature takes it to the next level. 
So um, there's all kinds of studies that are showing the compounds released by trees can have a effect on our endocrinal system. Um, as I say, um, in South Korea and in Japan, their health departments um, basically consider forest therapy a legitimate form of therapy. And so delinquent children, for instance, like bullies, are literally busloaded off into forests in South Korea um, to help them with becoming <laughs> nicer kids again. Um, so there's a lot of science that just shows that that can sort of work. And then there's studies that have shown that in... Um, cities across America where they have a lot of trees, there's less crime. Now, you could say that's correlation, not causation. Either way, um, it's just a simple, it's, it's far simpler and obvious. You plant trees, people will sit outside far more and interact as a community. What comes first? I don't know, but the trees are a really big part of it, you know. Um, where you have cities that have no trees, people don't commune. And so therefore a whole heap of um, other sociological problems, including crime, go up. So it's, you know, there's a whole, it, it, there's just so many studies that show that that works. One of the other ones that I really love, um, and sometimes I talk in water cooler sections of the book so that people remember them, but um, ba they've done studies on babies and the perfect um, motion for rocking them to sleep. And it's, at the, it's the pace of a medium-sized woman walking at an average pace. Mm -hmm. in, and if you go any faster, that baby won't go to sleep. Any slower, the baby won't go to sleep. That sort of pace is the perfect pace. And so, you know, it's kind of obvious why, right? We have yeah. been rocked to sleep on our mother's backs at the pace of her walking to and fro, I don't know, collecting berries or whatever. Um, it's a very modulating, um, connecting way to go about life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you also bring up the idea of being a flaneur as well. Pardon yeah. my French if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. That's right. Um, but the idea of walking the streets outside your front door um, and just kind of exploring that urban environment in a, in a very kind of Parisian way. Uh, do you think that that's a nice kind of gateway to, to getting into hiking yeah. for people who haven't done it? Yeah. Like, my thing is just walk. Like, I don't own a car. Like, you know, step one would be get rid of your car. Um, step two, and, and then that forces you to walk. Everything falls into place from there, and mm. you'll go up to shopping malls because it's you know it's a palaver. But um, yeah, you don't need to necessarily walk, walk in nature as a sort of a, an activity that you have to go out and do. Just walk out your front door, and twenty minutes is absolutely fine. But the flaneur is a concept that again developed in that same period that Nietzsche was mm -hmm. like in the late 1800s, and industrialisation was getting cultures around the world, Wordsworth in the UK, um, you know, uh, the various naturalists in the US, Nietzsche in Switzerland and the French in Paris. And the, it was a form of sort of um, disobedience was to walk in public. It was considered a bit uh, like be able to to walk in the public streets so the the intellectuals would do this and essentially it's walking around your neighborhood not venturing too far having no particular aim other than to observe what's happening on the street and of course we know anyone who's been to paris knows that that's what the french do yeah chairs all face outwards they go for a walk they sit in the cafe and they observe life um and it is a wonderfully um, freeing experiment to try. And I, I talk about what I did in Paris. I was having a bit of an anxiety attack and I end up having this crazy little adventure that becomes interconnected with, it involves Leonard Cohen and Claire Bowditch, who's a writer you, you'd know about because her book did very well uh, about six months ago. Um, it involves Ludillon, the, the art, French artist. I mean, it just turned into this interconnected sort of wonderful story. Um, and that's what happens when you do a flaneur. That's what happens when you walk on the street. That's what happens when you engage, engage, engage. Get out of your car, get out of the shopping mall, engage. <laughs> So um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I'm aware we are, we are rapidly running out of it. I've got, <laughs> <laughs> I've got so many more questions I want to ask you, but, but there, there's one here. It's a bit of a doozy. So, um, so, so let's see. Again, forgive me if, if this rambles. But um, you discuss in the book the relationship between um, the environment and, you know, the sea 
of, of capitalism. And I think just seeing kind of the, the end of 2019 and then into early 2020 um, with the school march for climate and then the bushfires, it really uh-huh. seemed like climate change was on the agenda in a really meaningful, tangible way. And that action and change could be around the corner kind of in, in, a, in a really big way. Um, and then COVID happened and it kind of got all pushed off the front page. And what do you think the way forward is now? And is COVID actually a climate change issue as well? Okay, I'll get a start from the, the last question. <laughs> yes, COVID is a climate issue. Um, and all of which is a capitalist issue, a consumption issue. So, you know, you could see COVID uh, and nobody knows exactly how it originated. We've got a fair idea as to why, though. Um, We have too many people on the planet and we are basically destroying the barrier between um, uh, the animal world and the human world and biodiversity, the reduction of biodiversity has all contributed um, to a perfect storm, you know, and and COVID resulted from this perfect storm. So um, I don't profess to know exactly how um, and when, but we know sort of what the conditions were. There's a lot of consensus on that. Um, so in terms of COVID, it's interesting. I see it as the great revealer. It revealed to us what was going on. And I think that, if anything, it revealed to us just what the climate um, debate was doing, like where it sat and where, where climate damage was was at. Um, and did it with the bushfires, you know. They were great revealers. And, yes, they um, dominated the headlines, as they should, Um, But I think what it did was actually expose in a very wonderful way, um, I say wonderful um, in terms of it just being real, um, what's going on, you know. And I suppose we could try to deal with them in terms of a way forward to answer your question. We could deal with them all as individual issues and we could get overwhelmed that all these different things are happening to humanity and how are we meant to pull it apart, decipher it and cope? Now, I actually think it's, it's accurate and also very helpful to see them all as the same thing, requiring the same path forward. And, and when I said before that the path forward ended up being far simpler than I could ever imagine, that gives you a bit of a clue. Like, um, we are off track. We are simply off track. And we need to get back on track. And the climate, you know, we think climate, but really it's a whole range of different things. The warming, the this, the that, um, you know, the carbon emissions. Um, it's all to do with the fact that we're not, we're living dis- in a disconnected way from life and the planet and each other. That's the problem. The solution is to reconnect. And, you know, it's, you know, in some ways, this one wild and precious life Essentially what I'd say is, um, you know, this is a one wild and precious life. We've only got the one. And to save it, we've got to come back to it. It's as simple as that. We've got to come back to it because we save what we love. Mm -hmm. So if I was to give you a one short answer to the way forward, we've got to love life again. Love life, be in it, engage with it, um, be true to it. And then we'll save it. And COVID, bushfires, pandemics, Black Lives Matters, all of that, it will reflect love rather than disconnection. And I know that sounds woo-woo. However, I do my very, very best in the 300-odd pages of my book to back it up with something resembling science. And you do an amazing job. Um, I think that's a, that's a great place to, to wrap things up. Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, thank you for taking this. the time to read the book and to asking some beautiful questions. Oh, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> and this one, Wild and Precious Life, is available right now at booktopia.com.au. See thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.